tall brook, the inner circle disciple. Um, one night I'm walking the ashram and the unheard of happened. Some school kids in his inner circle ran me down and said, Swami wants to see you upstairs in his apartment. Well, he gives interviews in the ground floor of his Prashanti Nilayam temple. He lives in the upper part, or did then. And this is a big deal. You know, in many ways, these are signs and wonders. And, okay, I go inside, go up the coveted stairs into where he sleeps and lives. And his high priest was there, a guy named Kasturi and Roger Reddy and other insiders. <clears throat> I knew this was a rare privilege, and I just hung out. He was counting sorries. And the next day, he would help me give them away to, to women. He kind of, I guess, mocked Christ-like feedings of the thousands, giving stuff away. When I was on Australian radio the other day, the guy asked me, well, aren't they good things? Yeah. But I said, if you had a PR agent and you wanted to run for the White House or some high political office, they would have you to create a better sort of public persona be Mr. Nice Guy. You would you would do outward virtuous acts and, and that's that doesn't seem impossible by any means. And of course he was doing that. He was fitting the whole bill of an avatar. He claimed to be an incarnation of God on the level of Krishna or Rama, the Kalki avatar. So I noticed a dark side, and I sort of filed it away, that, that there was some weird stuff going on. And um, I saw some of the disillusion of some of the disciples just breaking down. There were some nut cases that came out. Oh, boy, that doesn't look good. I thought he was going to heal this guy of something, and he's, they, they're shipping him off. Um, of course, he's going nuts. Hmm. Life under him was hard. I was a vegetarian in South India for two years, and it was hard. I was very driven to, to take it all the way up to Nirvikalpa Samadhi, through him to go all the way up to enlightenment. But there was this dark side that kept reappearing, and, uh, and I go into the chemistry of this in the book, what's happening with the people, the sort of the bizarre things going on. If you're at a distance, you're okay. You're safe. You can project on him. If you're right under the radiation field, you start to really pick things up. I did. And, and one of them, of course, was an interview where he put his hand down there in my fly, and I thought, wow, ooh, hmm, strange. Strange for God, you know. Um, is he feeling passion here? Yeah, he's breathing heavier. He's kind of rubbing my thing down there. Huh. Wow, that's kind of weird. Um, that was the beginning of an approach. There are a number of them, but I never responded. And the, the typical rationaling, rationalizing is, oh, he's purifying me. He's radiating down there in the, in the sex chakra to get away the lust. You know, everyone, young guys feel lust, you know, and... So he's doing that. He's purifying me of distractions so I can get enlightened. And then there's a part that says, no, <laughs> I mean, this is a pedophile. This is very weird. <clears throat> he's, uh... And then reports started to go out of more activities. And I'm going to jump ahead. By the time Line Publishing in England did my book, a shorter version called Lord of the Air that was on sale in India, and this is a return trip, some of his top inner circle students, young guys at the academy, got a hold of me, sent a letter and saying, um, what you reported has happened to us, and a lot of us are going to leave him and we're going to expose him. We don't think he's gone. We think something's really wrong. <clears throat> I've got another explanation I'm going to go into in a minute. When he so-called got in line as a kid, uh, they thought a local demon, a Grama Shakti, had possessed him, and it's probably really what happened. Something like that. 
Um, he got stung by a scorpion. A number of things happened that are part of an older occult, occult formula possession. And what I say is I think he was in a state of perfect possession. The darkness was eating away at my soul. And again, we're doing the short version, the full ones of the book. And I ran across a book in a bookstore that, because I grew up in an atheistic family, I wasn't aware of this stuff, but it basically said, by biblical standards, he is one of the antichrists predicted on the world. That he claims to be God, working great signs and wonders, and he's doing it to mislead the elect, and that's Matthew 24, 24. Well, that's an interesting thought. I actually started to read the Bible. I was getting desperate. And the truth is, um, I had tur- actually hurled the Bible, Bible open on a rock, and it came to Matthew 24, 24. And then this book uh, was dealing with a number of psychics and people who were really deceivers, I mean one of them being Edgar Casey, and suddenly a new thought entered my universe. And that is, wow, you know, well, I mean you're not going to go to Grand Central Station in New York and say to some stranger, here, hold my wallet. I can trust you. And there's this naive thing in the spiritual realm, when, oh, if it's spiritual, there can't be deception or bad people. Uh, or antichrists or demons, uh, because it's spiritual, it's all good. But you know enough to know that if you get hustle in a train station, there says, "Here, let me hold your passport and your wallet for a minute. And I'll just go. In, I'll go in here for a second. <clears throat> You're never going to see it again. And if that happens on a worldly level, it definitely happens on a spiritual level. And so, this book." Uh, that I read in the bookstore, Open a New Universe, in mentioning biblical verses that talked about lying wonders and, and false messiahs and antichrist and all that. I thought, that's a new thought has entered my universe. Unbelievable. Well, a number of these things happened, and another one is one of our people, a guy named Surya Das, was in the, we, we were all renting a house right near him in Whitefield, Bangalore area. South India, in sort of in a what had been an English farm community, a pretty neat place to live actually. And one of our people was down near the market where they sell mangoes and tea and that kind of stuff, and ran into an Anglo-Indian guy who had the sensual looks of a rock star. He had the sort of degenerate good looks, and we'd seen him before in line, we thought he was foreign, and no, he'd grown up there, he was local. And he said to Surya Das, well, uh, he basically wanted me to screw him, essentially. He took me in for a private interview, pulled down my pants. I think um, he's hermaphroditic because his organs were different. Uh, but wow. And this... When I heard that, I said to Siri Das, well, I haven't never told you this, but he's taken me into private interviews and done the same thing. I never responded. Kind of in shock, really hoping it would end as quickly as possible. And this Indian guy said, well, I didn't give a rip. I, you know, kind of responded to him and somehow entered him in a weird kind of way. Could have been between his legs, I'm not sure. And it just hit me like a sledgehammer because I knew it was real. He wouldn't. He, he had nothing to gain by telling us. He wasn't faking it. And he was pretty scared when he admitted it, but it, it's like he needed to tell the American insiders. And I was the top heavy. And so Surya Das, who was one of the people renting what we call the Blake cabin at the time, came back and said, Tell my universe just caved in. I've got to tell you about meeting this Anglo-Indian guy with rock star looks. And he said, Baba, pull him in for a private interview and try to screw him, you know, or have him screw him. And at that point, I'd had a number of kind of scary body out of, out of the body experiences at that point. 